If you got your Bibles, let's uh, turn over to 2 Corinthians, we'll be in chapter 5. When y'all, uh, when y'all find it, let's stand and let's honor the reading of the Word of God. Y'all remember the uh, years ago when uh, you know people people come to church? They'd be all, um, I mean, they'd be dressed up, man. Y'all remember back when women used to wear the, the hats in church? Remember? Remember those? You used to see the hats with the bouquets on, look like the Chiquita banana lady coming into coming into church. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about it a lot this morning because, especially now, you know, I'm not a, I'm not wearing a, a jacket this morning. I'm wearing I'm wearing a vest. Now that has less to do with what I'm talking about, more to do than whether I've lost a, some weight recently. I need to uh, need to make sure I'm dressed where my clothes aren't going to fall off. But um, today's message is, is titled "Clothed in Righteousness," uh, and I give these things a name to make them easier for people to people to steal. Like I tell you all the time, because you know people like to steal one with a that's got a name to it. But we're talking about being clothed in righteousness today, and I want to uh, I want you to think about this, and I want I want you to to ask yourself. This has nothing to do with with what you're wearing today. This has nothing to do with. It. I'm not one of those people that. Uh, that that thinks that that you you got to dress up when you when you come to church. I mean, I I happen to believe that Jesus preached in in sandals. So I I, I happen to believe that uh, I happen to believe that they walked around with some dirty old feet and had to wash them off when they went in somebody's house. Uh, I happen to believe that John the Baptist wore a uh, wore a remnant of, of of camel's hair. So I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, that. Uh, that John the Baptist wasn't a, a three-piece suit kind of guy. I, I want you to I want you to know that. And and if he lost any weight eating eating honey and locust, which I imagine he did, I, I imagine uh, that he had to had to worry about clothes falling off of him from time to time too. So, what I'm talking about today is being clothed in righteousness. Now, Bibles like mine are going to be on page 1382. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house made with hands, excuse me, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so, be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the self selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk, in, we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in our consciences." For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that ye may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then, there, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, and that, and that they which should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth, know we know man after the flesh, yea, though we know Christ after the flesh, we now henceforth know we him no more. 
Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then... We are ambassadors of Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye, not, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Father God, Lord, we come to you, Lord, today in the name of Jesus, Lord, the name above all names, God, Lord. We thank you today for the reading and the hearing of your word, Lord. Lord, we thank you today that, Lord, that for the, the righteous clothes, Lord, that you have waiting on us that believe, God. Lord, we thank you today, Lord, that we can put off this body of flesh, Lord, and, and be with you in glory, God. Lord, we thank you for all that you do. But most of all, we thank you for sending your Son to die on the cross for our sins. It's in Jesus' precious and holy name I pray. Amen. I'll be seated. So, one of the great uh, one of the greatest themes in Second Corinthians is the suffering of Christians, and I, I've um, I've been talking to you recently about about the the smell that that comes off of a of a person there uh, when when you're in God's will when you're suffering in the name of Christ that suffering that you do for Him. That, that suffering that you do as a Christian, it comes with a sweet savor to Him. When you're sacrificing and suffering for God, it is pleasing to God. When you're out there living like the world and smelling like the world, it is not pleasing to God. So when it comes down to, to 2 Corinthians here, we have a great theme of suffering as a Christian. You know, people say all the time... Uh, you know, be a man or uh, put your big boy pants on. This is where uh, this is where I got to take one out the the Mormon playbook here and tell you to, to put your uh, put your, uh, your 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 big boy your Christian underwear on. But but you know the Mormons they wear special underwear in case y'all didn't uh, didn't know they they have, they have to keep them on all the time. It's it's a real funny thing. You should check it out. It's real 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 interesting. Frank Frank's like, can I get a pair of those uh, those special underwear? Uh, they, that I'm t I'm telling you they they got special drawers, Frank. But on this side of heaven, suffering is absolutely guaranteed. And I want you to understand this. You, you may be thinking, well, I suffered before I was a Christian. You probably did because suffering is not exclusive to Christians. Everybody is going to suffer. Everybody's body is going to wear out. It doesn't matter what we do. It doesn't matter how much you hydrate. It doesn't matter how... how uh, Jeremy's drinking them yellow Red Bulls. It don't matter how many of them you drink or don't drink, your body's going to wear out. They, they give you a little bit of energy, you drink them things, it don't matter. One day you ain't going to be able to drink enough of them to have energy. It, it, one day it's not going to matter how much coffee you drink. I'm there now where coffee doesn't give me energy. I can go to sleep after I drink stuff now. But there's, there's coming a time when your body is going to deteriorate no matter how many weights you lift, no matter how much anything you do, no matter how healthy you think you are, your body will deteriorate and you will succumb to it and you will pass away. It is what it is. It's going to happen. We've got anywhere from zero to about the maximum, about 120 years that we're going to walk on this planet before our body succumbs to it. Most people don't make it to 120 years. The Bible says that a good life is 70 years, a blessed life is 80, and after that you're on borrowed time. Sorry about that, Patsy. I know you're out there on borrowed time already. But I, I, want, I, want to, I want to just let you know that you're going to deteriorate. It's going to happen. I'm going to deteriorate. Baby Bo is back there already deteriorating. We're going to wear out. Everybody's going to taste death outside of those that the Lord calls up to meet him in the air. Those folks, those folks aren't going to take it. They'll be, they'll be raptured out, so to speak. No one's getting out alive other than them. I was reminded recently, though, from a, by a brother in Christ that I've met on, uh, met on TikTok, brother uh, Wes Bridges. I, I like to I affectionately call him my top hat because I couldn't pronounce his name when I first met him. But 
I was reminded by him of something that I put in the Redeeming the Time book. I, I, I put an illustration in there about how I'm, I'm afraid to, to die naked. Like, I don't, I don't, want, I don't want to die naked. Like, I, that's, that's embarrassing. Right? I, I, I'd rather do a lot of things other than that. And it may, it may seem funny, but I put it up there with drowning and, and burning alive. I do not want to die naked. It just, absolutely not. It, it's, it, it's out there. It, it, it may seem silly, but for me, that is a legitimate fear. And one of the many promises that we have as a Christian is we do not have to face eternal nakedness. Anybody ever had that dream where you went to work or to school naked? I think just about everybody's had that where you where you stood up in front of where you stood up in front of a crowd and 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 you was there in your birthday suit and you you was embarrassed and you woke up in a panic from it. Show of hands, who's had that dream? Been been somewhere, been naked. Come on now, don't don't be messing with me. Come on, y'all y'all have had that dream. You've been cheering, <laughs> at cheer naked. How how terrible, right? <laughs> like, like I, I thought just being in front of a classroom, but you're talking about being in front of a whole football stadium or something. That that'd be uh, that'd be rough right there. But um, but I, lots of people ha- have that legitimate fear of being being exposed, have their nakedness exposed here. And for a Christian, we don't have to worry about being eternally naked. 2 Corinthians 5 and 1 says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house made not with hands eternal in heaven. Now in verse 1 we read about this tabernacle. This tabernacle is our physical bodies. Our fleshly bodies serve as the dwelling place for our spirit and our souls. Our bodies expire, but our spirit and souls are going to live forever in one of two places and in one of two conditions. They're, you're either going to live forever in heaven or you're going to live forever in hell. You're either going to be in heaven clothed or you're going to be in hell naked as a jaybird. One of the two. Second Corinthians 5 verses 2 through 4 says, For in this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. Now, this isn't somebody that's so big they need a house to wear instead of a suit of clothes. This is talking about that tabernacle that's in heaven being the clothes that we'll put on. If so, be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we are in this ta- we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not that we should be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. <clears throat> it ought to be our desire, our earnest desire as a Christian, to be with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, there is a mentality out there where people are willing to trade the kingdom of heaven, they're willing to trade the righteousness of Christ for earthly pleasures. Folks will literally trade heaven for a good time on earth. There's a song, some of you may may know this one, um, by Kenny Chesney. Kenny Chesney, he sung a song, and there was a a lyric in the song that says, Everybody wants to go to heaven, have a mansion high above the clouds. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to go now. In that song, Mr. Chesney also claims that he speaks for a crowd of people. And I'm certain that he does. I'm certain that he speaks for a crowd of lost folks. I'm certain that he speaks for a crowd of fleshly Christians. But if you're blood-bought, born again, happy to be saved, and a child of God, your focus ought to be on heaven. Not on all of the distractions that the world has to offer. Your focus ought to be on heaven. Because God has, has not, not, not just on these distractions of the world, not on the distractions of the, of the flesh, and not on the distractions of, of the, the devil. It ought to be on God. Because there's coming a time where you're going to be sitting there naked as a jaybird or either clothed in righteousness, and your focus ought to be on, on what it takes to be clothed in righteousness. Now, I'm, I want to just say it that Mr. Chesney does not speak for me. If you're like me, if you're like the Apostle Paul, you ought to be homesick for heaven. 
Philippians 1 verses 21 through 24 says, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. See, the Apostle Paul knew that if he were to die, it would be his gain. It would be, he would gain heaven at that time. It would be a wonderful thing for him. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor, yet what I shall choose, I what not. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. The Apostle Paul knew good and well that his mission as a Christian was to be here while he was here to serve those that were here to lead them to Christ for their benefit, not for him. If, it, if Paul was going to get what he wanted, Paul would have just died right then and went on to glory because Paul got to see what heaven was like. He got taken up to that third heaven. He knew what it was. He knew he wanted to be there. He knew this place had nothing to offer for him. And he knew good and well that this, that this place has just nothingness. This place has nothing but, but sorrow. This place has nothing but torment on us while we're in this, this suit of rotten flesh. And he knew the, the goodness of God that was waiting on him there. The Apostle Paul was arguably the greatest Christian to ever live. And he longed to put off his body of flesh and put on the clothes for him that God had, had in heaven. Y'all, y'all ever get a, 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 a new set of clothes and that fits just right? My goodness, you, 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 know how, you know how that is. You know, you got that, that ratty old thing and you, you, you're, wear, you're wearing it around and it's time to get, time to get some new clothes and you, and you go up there and you, you, get something that's, you get something that's new and it fits real good and, it, it, and, and you look good and then you feel good. And all that. You know, that what we feel here on heaven, uh, Patsy, it ain't got nothing to do with what something feels like in Chico's. I mean, what we get, what we get in heaven is going to be something completely different here. Uh, what, what, what we get is going to, it's going to, it's going to fit right. It's going to, it's going to not just fit right. It's going to make you look right as well. And we need to be, be looking forward to that. Second Corinthians five nine, uh, Second Corinthians five verse five through nine. The Word of God says this. Now he that wrought us for the self same thing is God who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. When a believer passes from this life to the next... They get to be with their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And there is nothing that we can think of that would be greater than that. When we get to heaven, there's no more pain. There's no more sorrow. But there is something in heaven. There's something up, there's something up there that uh, people, people have a misconception about heaven here. People, people don't think that there's anything negative at all in heaven. There is. And I'm going to tell you what it is right here. There's shame. In heaven, there's no there's no more sorrow and there's no more pain, but there's plenty of shame to go around. When we get to heaven, all of our works, both good and bad, are going to be on display. Now, let's just say, for example, that all of the bad is completely wiped away, and nobody ever knows about the bad that you and I've done. Nobody in heaven knows. Okay, let's just say that there's still shame. If only the good is rolled out. If that's all that people can see, if, if, if they can only see the good that Robert's done, then Robert's probably going to be ashamed. And I, I'm going I'm to tell you why Robert will be ashamed there. Some folks are going to have some, some decorations on their, on their clothing. And some folks are going to have crowns. And some folks are going to have nothing to show at all. 
Some folks are never going to be led anybody to the Lord. Some folks are never going to be read the Word of God. Some folks are never going to have been faithful to attend church. Some folks are never going, some folks are just never going to have anything to show. When we start thinking about fine remnant, and we start looking, or remnant, we're talking about clothes, that's a fancy word for clothes. When we start thinking about, about clothes and scripture and people that are adorned in these fine clothing, these fine linens, I, I want you to understand that they had they had things woven on them. If you've ever been in the military, you might you might remember, you know, someone would have a their um, their their badges and their medals. You would you would have them up here on your chest and people could see you. It kind of similar to that. These people would have their their family crests written in them here on here on earth now. And when you think about Joseph and his coat of many colors, you know, you get this idea that it looks like one of them um, one of them uh, Mexican shawls or whatever that that'll be just like thick, thick, thick with colors. But no, it would have been fine white, and it would have been it would have been nice embroidery inside of it. And I I really got a feeling here that's what we're what we're dealing with in heaven. We we got these these clothes with this fine embroidery on it, where people would be able to look at you and tell the good works that have been done that have been done there. Now I know plenty of people that on this side of heaven uh, that they will do everything in their power to make someone think that they've done good. They'll go out of the way, they'll lie, they'll cheat, and they'll steal to make sure that you think that they've done good. But when it comes down to being in heaven, when it comes down to being in glory, you're not going to be able to fake anything. It is going to be on display. You will either be adorned in this fine raiment or, and have crowns with jewels in it or you will not. Now everybody that gets to heaven is going to get this, this, uh, this not, nice pretty uh, fine white linen. Everybody's going to get that. But you're going to, some of you are going to be walking around with absolutely nothing on it and that's going to be shameful because everybody there is going to know that you did absolutely nothing for Christ while you were here. Everybody will know that. And let me tell you now, you're not going to get any do-overs. This will be eternal. This will be eternal shame. I, I, I think about it, I, I, don't want to, I don't want to die naked. I sure don't want to get in eternity and have nothing to lay down at the feet of Jesus. Nothing at all. Mr. Matthew, can you stop that? Thank you. 2 Corinthians 5, 10 and 13. The Word of God says this, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. You will stand before God and He will reward you based off of the good and off the bad. So if, it's not just that hey, I told you, hey, we're going to let's forget about the bad for a moment. The bad's going to be there too. There's going to be shame in heaven. There's, and, and you think, oh, I made it to heaven. That, that's, the, that's the best part. Yeah, that is the best part. But now for the rest of eternity, are you going to be shamed while you're there? Because I, I'm telling you, some of you will be. Maybe not some in this room. Definitely some that have watched this. Maybe some in here. Probably even myself. Let me just throw that out there. But we're living in the Laodicean church age where lukewarmness is running rampant. Professing believers refuse to be vocal about their beliefs for fear of offending someone. I've had people tell me the reason that they do not witness is because they're afraid to look stupid. I've had, peop I've had especially teenagers tell me that the reason they don't witness is they're afraid to, to not look cool in front, in front of their friends. Eternity is at stake. You don't want to look stupid? You don't want to don't not look cool? Then you might as well be putting some work in now, doing something for Christ now, because for eternity you're going to look stupid and uncool. You're going you're gonna to look at somebody, and they're, they're, they're going to look at you and they're going to be like, man, were you even saved? Were you, you were, I mean, what, what were you doing out there? Were, were, you, were you wasting your time? Well, you must have died on your deathbed because you've got nothing to show for it, brother. Let me give you a good, good idea of where you can start if you want, if you want to have uh, some treasures up in heaven. You can start by reading the Word of God. Because if you'll read the Word of God, 
and you'll study the Word of God. The Word of God will reveal things to you that you can clean up. The Word, the word of God will give you some, some information that you can share with somebody else. Pray often. Give cheerfully. Attend church faithfully. Worship without shame. Be a witness to others of the love of Christ. Those are some places where you can start. Uh, recently, the, the Lord has been, uh, been jumping back on me again. I, when, I first started, uh, when I first started preaching, God was all over me about, uh, about uh, shooting down Calvinism. I mean, he, he was all over me. He recently got back on me. Uh, uh, he's been showing me more of the wickedness of it. As, as we look at the, the next passage, it ought to become crystal clear for us how, how the doctrine of, of limited atonement is nothing more than re religious dung that's deployed by Satan. Satan does this. He wants to rob folks of the assurance of salvation. Satan wants you miserable. If you do buy into the false teachings of Calvinism, it's going to change your motivation to serve God. Instead of serving Him out of devotion, instead of being focused on the judgment seat of Christ, you'll serve God to, to hope to prove that you're saved. You'll try to earn something that's given away for free. So let's put to, be, to bed this false doctrine of limited atonement. And I, I want you to understand what it, what it is. There's, um, there's two different versions of limited atonement, and we'll, we'll address both of them quickly. Uh, one version of it is... Uh, is that some sins aren't covered by the blood of Christ, like murder and things like that. That's one version of it. There's another version of it, uh, and it's just equally just as incorrect. Uh, there's another version that the, the grace of God is limited to only those people who God's chosen to, to, to believe. We're going to just put it to bed real quick. 2 Corinthians, 15, 5, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then all were dead. First off, if one died for all, speaking of Christ dying for all, then all were dead. He died for all. This word all, it means all. Everyone is sinful. Everyone is unrighteous. Everyone is bad. Everyone is dead. Everyone needs a Savior. But when we start using words like all, you know, that, that, that word's a little bit too big to, deal, to, to use when you're talking to a Calvinist because they're going to be quick to tell you that all doesn't mean all. And what a load of baloney. Let's look at verse 15, and we can see where, where God actually separates all into two different groups of people. Verse 15, and that he died for all, comma, if your Bible's like mine, you got a comma there, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Now, if you pay attention to verse 14, if one died for all, then all were dead. Here in verse 15, and that he died for all, comma, that they which live, so some are alive now, so all were dead, and now some were alive that they which should, should live, uh, excuse me, and they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. So we've got folks that are dead, and we've got folks that are alive, but we've got Christ dying for all. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we no more? So the questions, the, the questions being asked here, uh, do, do we not know Him anymore? We ought to be able to plainly see in verse 15 that Christ died for all, but not all will live. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, verse 17 is one of those verses that a, a soul winner will be behooved to have memorized. Here we can, we can look and see as... Uh, whether or not we can we can test the water of whether or not we're we're saved or not. I mean, I'm gonna read it again for you. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So, since you've been saved, have your desires changed? 
Do you still want the same things that you used to want? Is pleasing God your priority? There ought to be a time. You know, I can, I can tell you when I got saved. I don't remember the, what date it was. I remember exactly where I was at when I got saved. I didn't, I didn't write the date down or anything like that. But I, I can tell you um, where I was when I got saved, what I was doing, all that good stuff. And more importantly than telling you where I was, who I was talking to, more importantly than that, I can tell you what changed after I got saved. I can tell you that everything changed. I can tell you that I did a complete 180. And I, I can tell you that there's times where I like to get into that old flesh and like, and like, to, and like to, to, to do things that a Christian ought not do. I can tell you that. And when those times come, I can tell you that conviction comes with it. I can tell you that I'm very aware of just how sinful my flesh is. And prior to coming to Christ, I couldn't tell you that. I thought I was pretty good, man. I thought I was great. I thought, I, I thought hey, you know, every, everything is just fantastic. I, I'm doing as good as, as, a, as a man knows how to do. And I'm going to tell you what, as good as a man knows how to do is not good enough. We need Christ. And a Christian ought to be able to look back to a time before they knew Christ and look at themselves now and see a difference. And if you don't see a difference, maybe it hasn't been that long. But if it's been a while, you need to ask yourself, why hasn't there been a difference? Why hasn't there been a, a change in my life? Do I at least feel bad about my sin now? I, I was thinking about uh, I was thinking about Miss Robin <laughs> the other night. This uh, this got a got a kid. I mean, and praise God, we got a praise report. Miss Robin, she's on the transplant list, so uh, we're uh, we're thankful for that. She's uh, hopefully she'll be getting a uh, uh, kidney soon. And I was uh, I was inquiring uh, about it to find out uh, to see if I'd qualify to give her to give her a kidney or not. But evidently, if you got diabetes, you don't qualify for stuff like that. So I I, I was looking looking into it, and I got to thinking about this thing. I remember hearing stories about um, something called cellular memory transference. Uh, this is where somebody gets an uh, organ from a donor and then they start taking on the characteristics of that donor. Now, <clears throat> I got to think about this with Miss Robin. Could y'all imagine Miss Robin getting my kidney and then coming in here one Sunday with suspenders on and a Diet Pepsi in her hand? Because that's, that's what would have happened to you, Miss Robin. I, I, a Diet Pepsi in one hand, an ice cream sandwich in another hand, a King James Bible under arm and a pair of suspenders, and, and you might have started growing a red beard. Uh, that that would have uh, that would have been what would have happened there. I, but I got, I got to thinking about that as I was preparing this message. And I want you to think about what happens when God replaces that old rotten heart of flesh with a new clean heart. Uh, Psalms 51, verses 10 through 17 says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise." For thou desirest not sacrificed, else would I give it. Thou desirest, de delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifice of God, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, thou wilt not despise. That's what I got to thinking about with this thing because when we get that, that new heart from God, we are to start taking on those godly characteristics right there. When you've got a new heart, heart, the evidence ought to show in the fact that you're trying to lead folks to Christ. Ezekiel 36, verses 26 through 27 says, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. Since you've been converted, has there been a change? When we trust Jesus Christ as our Lord, of, Lord and Savior, we are positionally sanctified. We're saved and we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. The transaction of our sin for His righteousness ought to produce good fruit. It is the will of God 
for Christians to be obedient. And let's face it, Christians are not always obedient. Another lie that gets propagated by the Calvinists is that you can resist the urging of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'd like for somebody, anybody, to name one Christian who has been completely obedient to the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about a saved person. I'm talking about a blood-bought, born-again person. I want to know one person who has not resisted the Holy Spirit. Christians now. People that had the Spirit of God dwelling in them. If a blood-bought, born-again Christian with a new heart can ignore the urging of the Holy Spirit, then why in the world wouldn't a lost man be able to ignore the Holy Spirit as well? Do you mean to tell me that the Holy Spirit working inside of a man is not as strong as the Holy Spirit working outside of a man? Acts 7, uh, 51 says, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. There it goes. They're resisting. But according to the uh, false doctrines of Calvinism, no, they're not. They say that the man can't resist. Well, Jesus said that they could. The Apostle Paul said they could. Luke said that they could here in the book of Acts. 2 Corinthians 2, 18 through 21. Let's look at it here. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed us uh, committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Man has absolutely no way to save himself from eternal damnation. Even if there was a way for man to save himself, man wouldn't be qualified to do so. For anyone who has ever believed the lie that Jesus died for some and not for all, let's let Scripture uh, set the record straight. God is in a way-making business. He makes those ways for those who have no hope. Now, let's say for a minute that the Calvinist is right. Let's say that, that the, the blood atonement is limited. Who wouldn't have hope then? The ones that weren't chosen, right? They wouldn't have hope. But God makes a way where there is no way. Isaiah 43 and 19 says, Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth, shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and a rivers in the desert. You know, for those of out there that have bought into the lie that, that they're not one of the chosen, not one of, not one of the uh, elect, they're not one of the, the predestined to, to, to be saved. You know, if you've bought into the lie, I want you to understand this. You are in a more qualified position to be saved right now than anybody else ever has been in the history of the earth because you understand how bad you are. You understand it. And we serve a God that makes a way where there is no way. You've been told there's no way? Good. God can make that way. John 3 and 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, there's a few words in Scripture. All of it's good. But there's a few words I want to leave you with here. Every word in Scripture means exactly what it says. But there's still a few that ought to give you just a little bit more hope and a little bit more assurance of your salvation. All means all. Whosoever means whosoever. Everlasting means everlasting. And I thank God that all of my sins have been paid for and that I'm a whosoever with everlasting life. And your sins can be paid for in full today. All you must do is believe the gospel. If you want to go to heaven and be clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ... Simply believe that Christ died for your sins according to the Scriptures and was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And if you want to go to hell where you'll be naked as a jaybird, 
believe anything else, anything else will do just fine. Father God, Lord, we come to you, Lord, today in the name of Jesus, Lord, the name of all names, God. Lord, I pray if there be one under the sound of my voice that doesn't know you, Lord, they'd come to know you before it's everlasting too late, God. Lord, we just thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is true, God. We thank you that you died for all, Lord. We thank you that you made a way where there was no way, Lord. And, Lord, we pray that while, we're, while we tarry here on this little blue and green planet, God, that we will serve you faithfully, God, and stack up our rewards in heaven, Lord. Lord, we, we pray that when we're, when we're standing up there, Lord, that we don't have to, to stand in eternity and in, in embarrassment, God, that we can serve you here and now, Lord. Lord, and be, be well clothed and fine remnant when we, when we praise you in eternity, Lord. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. In Jesus' precious and holy name I pray. Amen. Altar's open if y'all got business to do with the Lord.